So, let's get cracking with the UEFA president, Alexander Chefrin. talking about what a, an incredible tournament it is, it's easy just to say, hasn't it been fantastic, but all the records suggest that this is groundbreaking. For example, attendances have doubled in this tournament from the last one in 2017 in the Netherlands. Over 300 million viewers are expected to have watched this tournament, making this UEFA Women's Euro one of the top global women sporting events ever. So. Um, are you going to take all the credit for that? No, we'll give you. We'll give you some of it. We'll give you some of it. But I mean, how would you sum up your feelings of witnessing this tournament in the past month and hearing those statistics? I mean, it was a, an amazing tournament. It is still. It will finish only tonight. Uh, we expected a lot, but to be honest, even we didn't expect so much. So the numbers are amazing, but. It's not only the numbers that are important. The matches are great. Goals are super nice. Uh, the technical skills of the girls, unbelievable. So I'm very happy that we succeeded. Mm. And when you look at what's gone into the women's game coming up to this point, here we are in 2022, it's bigger than better than it's ever been before. How do you reflect on that growth and how we've got here? Look, to be honest, uh, I don't do much. I mainly support the, the, the women's game. Uh, we have a great team at UEFA. I would uh, thank and praise Nadine here. I don't know, probably she's here somewhere. Ah, there. Uh, she is really leading it, but of course it helps if the president supports. <laughs> so uh, it was a lot of hard work and quite an investment and we had to believe in it. The most important thing is that, that you believe in what you are doing and from the beginning we knew that we can come to a much higher level. Now, if I would say that we knew that we'll come to a Euro like this so fast, might be a bit too much. I'm not sure if we, we, we thought about that, but we knew that it will be the biggest, the biggest Euro uh, ever. Let's say the biggest Euro till now until now and hopefully of course it will go on and get bigger and bigger that's the idea but you sound a little bit surprised that perhaps this has happened quite so quickly I mean what elements of surprise are there what has surprised you the most is it the I number mean, of fans or is it the quality the standard I'm, I mean I'm not very much surprised I knew that uh, uh, about the quality we are following women's football the numbers are amazing but the biggest surprise for me is uh, the ones who are surprised that women's football is at such a level because there were many people doubting it at the beginning. And now the same ones are saying that, that they knew, but this, <laughs> this is typical. <laughs> yeah, you're surprised that people are surprised that how surprising this tournament's been. I'm surprised at that as well, frankly. Um, in terms of where we go from here, that's what this forum is all about. It, it, it's easy to go, well, hasn't it been great? Hasn't Hasn't everything been fantastic? Haven't we done well? And pat ourselves on the back, whoever the stakeholders here are. But really, this tournament is about where we go from here. How do we get bigger? How do we become more professional? How do we grow commercially? How do we make all these things happen? From your perspective, what are the next steps? We have to develop women's football exactly in the same way as men's football. We have to develop it on a technical level. We have to invest. It's, it's not a big difference. You have to go, we have to go in the same way as we went uh, till now. And we will go. Um, I think that, as I said yesterday, maybe some people should or start thinking that it's worth investing into women's football. It's not enough just speaking about equality and we love women's football. It would be good to believe in it. And if you, if you believe in it, you invest into, into the game, and then I think that, that would uh, help a lot. Who do you mean should invest? Sponsors, broadcasters, and everyone else. Mm. 
And talking about this zero being the biggest yet, you obviously want the next one to be bigger, et cetera. There is so much growth and development going on. How do you think that can happen? What is the benchmark? I mean, the bar is high, mm. very high, and then uh, it's tough for the next host. We still don't know who the next host will be, but uh, to match these numbers uh, will not be easy. But uh, we all have to work in that direction, and, and uh, we absolutely shouldn't go lower. Mm. At least to stay to and this level, it would be great. And ideally keep growing as well. I mean, we are in 2022 now. I'm thinking where we were 12 years ago. We had the Olympics women's football tournament in this country. There were 70,000 at Wembley for Team GB against Brazil in the group stage. There was a final attendance of 80,000. But then women's football hasn't always grown from the last big event and taken it on to the next one. But now we are here with this record breaking event 10 years later. Where do you anticipate women's football will be in 2032? First of all, it's not only about the Euro. It's Champions League is always sold out. Champions League finals, we had uh, records at, at the club uh, football as well. Uh, the simplest way to answer to your question would be that I would like uh, football in the next two years to grow as much as it grew in the last two years. Because the difference from 10 years from now, it's, it's amazing. Mm. So we'll try to do our best. I'll try to support as much as I can. So you'll support and you're calling for more investment from the sponsors, as you mentioned, from football federations, everyone to support the women's game, invest, put money into it and watch it grow. Yes, absolutely. I think it's worth investing. Mm. It's not, uh, you know, you cannot speak of helping women's football it's worth investing. And if I'm very straightforward, now it's the time to invest into women's football because it's, it's growing extremely fast and it's not so expensive yet. <laughs> so now it's time to invest. That's my humble opinion. Okay, that's your very humble opinion. Thank you so much. Thank you. UEFA President Alexander Chepard. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. The president has a busy day ahead, so thank you for your time this morning. There is a team on the west coast of America you will all have heard of, I'm pretty sure about it by now, because this is a very, very exciting time. There is celebrity involvement in it, which is probably why you may have heard it in the headlines, so a very new and exciting, innovative approach to investing in football, in sport, in women's football. And it's a bit of a culture shift as well. It's about women and girls. It's about promoting diversity, especially in this brand new club. They've taken a very fresh approach to setting up a new club. And it's a sports club, but it's also a business property. And Cara Nortman is the co-founder of it. It is Angel City in Los Angeles. And you're going to have to be nice to her because they went 2 nil up last night against O.L. Reign, and they lost 3-2 to an 89th minute Tobin Heath winner. So be nice to her. She is Cara Nortman. Yes, beautiful people. Do you know what's better than putting on for your city? Is your city putting on for you? Uh, yeah, the city putting on for you, yeah. See the world recognize the truth, huh? And now you, and now I'm... LA's new soccer team, founded by some of the most famous women in sports and entertainment. It was founded by actress Natalie Portman, and it is backed by a star-studded group of women investors creating the largest female lead ownership group in professional sports.
Kara Nortman. I am one of the co-founders of Angel City, and I'm so thrilled to be here with you all today. Um, when we set out to build this club, we were trying to build a club that was bigger than a game and really to show what is possible in women's football. Uh, it started three years ago when my co-founder, Natalie Portman, I think actually maybe even three years ago to this day, when my co-founder, Natalie Portman, texted me and said, let's start a women's football club. I thought she was crazy, uh, but when the queen of Star Wars texts you, you listen. Uh, we went out, I went out and did some work and probably got a hundred no's when I was raising our first million dollars of capital. Fortunately, I got one yes from Alexis Ohanian um, and Serena Williams, and it was approximately three weeks before COVID began. Sometimes I think if it was three weeks later, I may not be standing on this stage. Uh, flash forward to last night, Sophie, congratulations. Uh, broke my heart a little bit this morning, I have to say. Uh, through, and we had a sold out crowd, 22,000 people for our 13th game. Um, and I invite you all to come to our stadium and we can show you what's possible because it's possible everywhere. And so I'm gonna tell you my story, our story, the Angel City story, but I think what's most important is that everyone in the room is writing a story. Everyone in the room has the power to build this 50 more times in your own way. Um, you don't, and so, you know, whether you've been in the sport for 40 years or you're coming to it today, coming out of tonight, everything is possible in my mind. Call me if you don't believe it, and I would be happy to help. So with that, um, I wanted to start with this picture. This is a picture of my middle daughter. My little daughter is over there. The middle one's still sleeping. But um, this was at the 2015 Vancouver World Cup. And you can see the look on my face. I mean, that is the look of pure joy, childlike joy. Where it's the joy you'll see on my face tonight. It's the joy I experience every time I sit in a crowd. Here I was just a fan. I was not an owner. And what I experienced in the stadium on that day was almost euphoric. I saw myself in the crowd. People were painting my face I had never met. It did not feel like a men's sporting event in America. It felt like something, a place where I belonged. And so as I left that game, I said, why can't we have this more than every four years? Why can't we have this all the time? Um, and so that was the beginning of my journey. I think it's really important to love and appreciate the energy that comes from sitting in these stadiums and to realize that energy can propel things to happen that you never imagined. But what happened for me next is I went to nine stores in Vancouver trying to buy football shirts for my three daughters. And guess what? I found one in nine stores that fit my daughters, and I could not find one with a name on the back. I was looking for Megan Klingenberg, a defender. Let's celebrate the defenders, please. Um, and I thought, why won't anyone take my money? Am I the only one in the city who wants to buy a, jer uh, a shirt? Not a jersey, it's a shirt, I know. Um, and then I, moved, I came back to LA and I wanted to watch games. I wanted to watch our club league, the NWSL. So I went to the only place I could find it, which was Yahoo Streaming. Yahoo's a little web property that started about 20 years ago. And I found a very mini Tobin Heath. She was that big. It looked like somebody was broadcasting it literally from outer space. It was so terrible, I could not watch. Um, and so I, I actually got a little angry, and I'm not an angry person, I'm a joyful person. I said, why won't people take my money? Why can't I watch this game that I love? And so I began my research, this was in 2015, and I just, I started talking to and asking questions of anyone who would listen, just as a fan of a sport, as a person who built tech companies. Um, and um, that led me to some statistics you probably all now know well. 4% of media attention goes to women's sport. Only, uh, only there was not a single full-time reporter or commentator covering the women's game in America. And so there was one thing I could find. It was called Instagram, which now I don't want my daughters on, ironically. Um, and on Instagram, I could follow the players. I could follow Sydney LaRue, and I could follow Ashlyn Harris and Crystal Dunn and their content was amazing. So I couldn't watch the game, but I could see them as 
activists and cultural icon and fashionistas, all the things like cultural things, places we want to spend money. And so I continued my journey and I knew it was possible. I knew if millions of people were going to show up on Instagram, it was possible. And I actually met this woman down here, Becca Rue, who runs the US Women's National Team uh, Players Association. Um, and she began to teach me the sport. And she asked me for help in the pay equity fight, or I offered the help in pay equity fight. And that's how I learned. I started as an activist. Um, and just a quick congratulations to Becca and to Cindy Parlo Cohn, who is the president, the first female president of US soccer, for the historic settlement to get the women in the United States, our US women's national team, paid in the same way as the men. Um, that was historic for us and the reason that I am here on stage. Uh, and so, any. <laughs> And so that's how it began. Natalie and I did not begin thinking we'd start a team. We just thought we were helping women get paid, if I'm honest. And so my two co-founders, meeting my two co-founders and, and, and starting this club with them was obviously the critical moment. And it happened three or four years after I went to that game, after I talked to hundreds of people, after I stalked players on Instagram. Um, so this is Natalie Portman. You may have heard of her. She is the mighty Thor. Please go watch the movie. She's the first woman in that role as well. You look at the look on her face, that is also the look of joy. It's a look, I think if you go look at when she won an Oscar, she's happier here. Um, uh, and um, you know, we went to lunch in 2018, and I told her about this pay equity fight. She said, how can I help? I said, well, I think you know some other famous people. Can you bring them? Can you put the games on Instagram? Can you bring awareness to the sport in the fight? And that's just what she did. And she invited Jennifer Garner, Garner and Eva Longoria. And that's where it began. Um, and then, you know, uh, six months later, she texted me and said, let's start a team about three times until I finally paid attention and said, OK, let me figure it out with you. Uh, and then we brought in this woman, Julie Ehrman. Julie uh, didn't come out of football. Uh, though she was a lifelong athlete. And I think this is an important point. She was a gaming executive, a streaming media executive. And you need people who understand sport. You need people who understand real estate. You need to have a stadium eventually where you can play and watch in the most amazing way. Um, but you also, I also would really encourage everyone to bring in people who don't know anything about the sport and who know different things. Because it really is, it's not just gender diversity, it is cognitive diversity. It is different opinions. It is having friction, getting angry at each other and moving forward. It is teams and clubs and unions and regulators and leagues all working together and appreciating that friction and that difference. Um, so Angel City is really about um, all of the different parts, the stakeholders coming together and seeing themselves in the world. This is what our supporters section looks like. That's a Japanese flag, by the way. Um, uh, Japanese Americans have so much pride in watching June Endo play a 21-year-old who came to us not speaking a word of English, uh, who's captured the hearts of everyone in our stands. But this is, you know, for us, for me, it's about building the world we want to live in, the world that we do live in in LA in every part of the organization. So our business team uh, is 75% female. It is 45 people of percent, 45 percent people of color. And our supporters group is kind of where it started. So Natalie, Julie, and I walked through the stands of an LAFC game. That's a men's team in LA. Um, and we saw somebody waving a flag saying, bring the NWSL to LA. And um, when we started, they were the first people we spoke to, or some of the first people, the Rojases. They anchored our first supporters group. We now have four. We had 2,300 people in that section last night. And we have a lot of unofficial ones. We build it person by person. And that is where we started. And that is how we ultimately have gotten to over 16,000 season tickets. Um, these are, you know, so one of the, so the, uh, the last kind of commercial point I want to talk about is our sponsorship model. So they're our stakeholders too. They allow us to do what we do. They support us. They give us money. We have to generate revenue. We have to pay players. We can't pay players unless we generate revenue. And so um, we've pioneered a new sponsorship model that now other teams in our league are also um, following as well, where we take 10% of every sponsor contract and put it back into the community. 
And so we have contracted $44 million in sponsorship revenue, which means over $4 million are going into community nonprofit causes off of our income statement and balance sheet. We don't have a foundation yet. Um, and so as an example, we have traditional sponsors like Nike, who's been amazing, and has donated a sports bra to girls who do not have them. You cannot play football without a sports bra um, for every season ticket purchase, so over 16,000. Gatorade, where we have um, taken that 10% and we're putting it into developing more female coaches, a program that does that. And we have new sponsors who've never looked at women's sport, like DoorDash. Uh, with DoorDash, for example, uh, we've taken um, that 10% and we're de we've delivered hundreds of thousands of meals and groceries to food insecure parts of LA for free. And so it is the full ecosystem. We now have, we have sponsors in fashion, in, in women's supplements, in women's alcohol. Turns out we spend 80% of the discretionary spend. But this all happens through the men. The men in the room pay attention. It all happens through you and you being our, our allies. Um, and so, I mean, these are the sorts of models, though, that show that mission and capitalism can go hand in hand. Many of our sponsors will not actually do a sponsorship anymore without a community component in it. We're very proud of this. So, um, you know, in sum, um, you know, people ask me all the time, why did I, why did I start Angel City? Why, why did I go on this five-year journey where people told me I was crazy for the first four years? And it's for three reasons. One, um, I wanted to show women should be paid a women, uh, the best women footballers in the world should be paid a living wage, and hopefully more. But let's start with a living wage. Two, I wanted to show we could pack stadiums. Everyone said it was impossible. It's possible. You know, if you have 150 years of following for a club, I don't know, you, it's possible, you can do it. Um, I wanted to show it was the most, it could be as entertaining as any sport in, in the world. And then third, and this is important, I wanted to show we could generate revenue and that we could, and I would say this, and I said this two years ago and people thought I was crazy, we at Angel City could be as valuable as Liverpool or the Dallas Cowboys. It sounds, it still sounds probably a little crazy to you guys, but I believe that is true, and I believe there are people in this room that will generate 40 more teams that show the same thing. Um, so my daughter asked me, my oldest daughter asked me about six months ago a question that kind of blew my mind, um, but she said it earnestly. She said, Mom, I'm curious, when is Angel City starting a men's team? <laughs> And I said, well, we, wow, you know, but this is the question on her mind. This is, you know, this is the way the world is growing up. Um, and so um, the, we talk about the daughters, but the sons see that too. And the change will come from people thinking like that. We don't think like that. They will think like that. Okay, I'm running out of time. I have to go quickly here. Here are my three follow-ups for you guys, what I learned. One, be an evangelist in your own style. Dream, if you're a dreamer, dream. If you're a skeptic, be a skeptic. Just find somebody who's different than you. Find your Julie or Natalie and point out impossible goals just at the right time. I dreamed for four years. I learned for four years. And then I said, here's what we need to do in revenue. Here's how many tickets we need to sell. Here's what we need to do in sponsorship. And that, it's the, it, no one to dream, no one to add a friend, and no one to you know, actually set metrics and deliver. Um, and I am going to wrap it up here. Um, I like to talk about this analogy, the field of dreams. Um, we all walk on this pitch together. Every time we go to a game, every time we, um, we, you know, somebody new walks onto the field, a young girl, a young boy, the pitch expands. Invite someone new in. I didn't get to grow up learning, thinking I could ever be a professional athlete or the president of the United States. Uh, we didn't have a queen or Margaret Thatcher. Um, and now our boys and girls both can dream about being a professional athlete. And I truly think these are the institutions and people believing that that will help keep our world healthy and joyful. And everyone here has a part. Thank you so much. <laughs>to adopt her and take her back to your country and get her to invest in women's football in your country we'd like you to do that i'm available my husband's over there he'll let you take wouldn't me. it yeah <laughs> supportive hi
<laughs> um, that's incredible. Thank you so much. Um, very inspired. I saw Kelly Simmons there of the FA nodding away. Investment, women's sport, full stadium, massive crowds from nothing. This is incredible. Let's all learn from that. Um, you said you couldn't be a professional athlete when you were growing up. You could be president. I'd be backing you. I'd be backing you. Um, the, the buzzword that we've had, particularly over here, and I know in the United States and around the world for women's football over the years, is sustainability. Not just that, but self-sustainability, because certainly over here, we have been very reliant on money from men's football and yeah. premier clubs, etc. Um, you haven't done that. What's your model for sustainability to make sure that this isn't a three-year, four-year, five-year project, then the money goes elsewhere, and then those players are out of a job, frankly? Yeah, so listen, it's really important for capital to come into the sport, but it's important for capital to come in in a way where you have people who believe they're, that they, at some point in time, they should put $100 million in the sport, but you start with a half or one, and you set goals against that. It's important, you know, so we raised $800,000 to start and we set some goals in place. And when you begin meeting those goals, we then raise five, and then we raise 15. Um, and so I think it's really important to understand income statements, right? I'm an investor, and I've built companies, and I've run big companies. And so um, I, I, it's really like staging it, but also having people available as the teams are delivering, and the clubs and the leagues, um, to put more in. I mean, so that's, it's critically important that you see delivery against those goals to keep going. Mm. And that's in terms of your club, you want to make sure the income keeps coming to your club, but obviously the league as well, because many of us have looked to the United States for many years, you know, we saw what happened in 1999 at the Rose Bowl, etc. And then we've seen failed leagues. Yes. How confident are you this time that the NWSL is the real deal, it's sustainable, it's going to continue to grow? I'm very confident. We have Jessica Berman sitting in the front row. She is the commissioner of our league. Um, <clears throat> uh, and you can look at the two prior leagues and say, why did they work? Why didn't they work? There's, a, there's an amalgamation of reasons, timing, you know, the right owners, the right capital, but it really is about leadership. So when you have a leader like Jess come in, everything, you know, it, it brings not just stability, but inspiration. You hire, she hiring the right people. You get the best talent in the world who wake up every day thinking that this can be the best league in the world. Um, that's where it starts, right? It starts at the top, and with Jessica, we were all so thrilled to, to bring her in. And then every day, Jessica has to make 100 decisions as to how she spends her time. And that's probably, you know, that and the people she's recruiting, I mean, that's what gives me the, the confidence that this is the right league. Because it's about, you know, gotta know where you're patient. And she'll tell you, sometimes I'm a little impatient, but she makes me more patient. Where are the places that she and we together can deliver revenue in the near term? And how do you set the foundation for the long term? But with any company, with any league, with any regulatory body, it starts with leadership that wants to hear hard things and then is going to make decisions and is going to get a lot of people with a lot of different opinions to follow. And um, so I, for me, it's leadership, it's capital, it's showing models work, and it's this moment in time. Summed up beautifully. Thank you, Cara Norman. Thank you so much. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. And now we have uh, somebody who has really paved the way in this country. She was a long time player on the English national side and she was in the final of Euro 2009 and she is here and going to be working on the final of Euro 2022, which apparently also has England and Germany in it, somebody told me. She is Alex Scott. <laughs> <laughs> Alex, so good to see you. Thanks wow, you I tell me. you what, just even looking at you and talking about those years ago brings back so many memories of where we've come from in the game in this country and where we're going to. And I'm going to talk to you in a moment about, um, about your journey and your, how you started and, um, and what you're trying to achieve in terms of diversity in football and broadcasting and all the rest of it. But first of all, I love your shoes. I've just seen those. <laughs> oh my it's goodness. It's because I have to wear heels later and I, everyone who used to play football, <laughs> I can't do heels. So yeah, Not rest in my ankles oh, later. Oh, I'm going to borrow those. <laughs> um, no, what I was going to ask you is about this tournament. Um, I was president of UEFA earlier about 
his reaction to it, about whether it surprised him. What have you made of it all? It doesn't surprise me to hear people speak and they're surprised that the record attendances and women's football at the moment, I think everyone in this room that has worked for so long knew it was always there. It was getting people to believe and to back it. And I think actually what it got me thinking about is moving forward from this tournament. I don't want to sit or stand up in front of rooms and beg for sponsorship for women's football anymore and stand there and explain the reasons why. Because if you are not getting on board now, then you're going to be very foolish because you have missed the boat. So yeah, getting left behind. Mm -hmm. We'll come back onto that a little bit more. But just take us back right to when you first started playing, a little lass from East London. Wait, there we go. <laughs> I was always Arsenal, Mr. Dean's in the room. Good job we didn't have a Spurs kit on. Yeah. No, no Harry Kane business going on. Um, but just tell us about why you started, how you started, what it was like. I think for most of us, and I think that's the change that we're going to see now, most of us 30 plus years ago, we started playing with boys. I saw my brother in a football cage, a concrete football cage at the end of my council estate, and it was all the boys playing football, but I just wanted to be like my big brother. I couldn't understand why there wasn't any more girls playing, but I just wanted to be in there. And I had to earn my stripes, earn my position. It made me tough, and they didn't treat me any other way. They didn't say, no, you can't play because you're a girl. I earned my spot. But that was the reality then, until Arsenal came knocking when I was eight, and which is a funny story. Someone saw me in a local tournament in my area and said, Alex, you, you know there's a women's team? <laughs> I didn't have a clue. I was like, no. He was like, I'm going to take you down for a trial. And I was like, I don't want to. I'm happy with playing with the boys. I didn't even know that that was the bigger picture because we didn't see it. So for me, I was just happy playing in the cage. But he took me down and... Yeah, the rest is history because I started playing for Arsenal. Mm -hmm. Once or twice. Yeah. <laughs> also, how lucky were you, by the way, that it was Arsenal? Yeah. The front runner in the women's game. And I think that's the thing with football there. It, it gave me... That's why I'm always so thankful because it took me out of an area. I had dreamed of traveling the world and seeing things, but I suppose when you grow up in a certain area, people make you believe that that's not possible, that you're not, not worth that. And football always gave me the opportunity and it's led me to this place today. So I'll always be thankful to the game. Yeah, I mean, you had the talent and went on to be able to show it, but you know, when I was growing up, there were no teams. I yeah. went to an all girls school and I asked my PE teacher, can I play, can we play? Mm -hmm. No, Yeah. that was it, end of story. Fast forward to I'm 17 and go to university, make a beeline for the women's football desk, then you can play. But if nobody in your area plays or coaches or allows you to play, you that's know. it. Yeah. But thank goodness you did have that option and you went on to have a phenomenal career. I want to see some more photos, by the way. <laughs> no, <laughs> don't embarrass me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, go on, let's embarrass you. Let's do that. Um, so you're inspired by the fact that your brother played. I always think that somebody should do a PhD or a master's or something in this because having, having covered the women's game for a couple of decades or so, yeah. virtually every women's player that I've commentated on or spoken to played because of their brother. Yeah. Uh -huh. Virtually everyone. The only one I could think of off the top of my head, Katie Zellum didn't, but her, her dad played professionally and her uncle played professionally. She was an only child. Yeah. Everyone had so many. But I think that's the change that we're now going to see. You have young girls growing up. In the documentary that I just did, you know, go into your local park now and the pathway for girls, organised tournaments for girls so you don't have to just go and play because your big brother played. What they're seeing on TV, the record crowds, the young girls, they're going to play because they love the game, because they can see it's a possibility for them now. Yeah. So when you were growing up, a lot of your peers I've spoken to before said that their heroes were, were fellas for obvious reasons because yeah. they're on the telly and uh -huh. they, they were playing in front of thousands of people. Who were your heroes growing up? <laughs> football -wise? You're all going to laugh because it's weird that I go off and leave you and go in, on TV and I'm standing alongside Ian Wright, yeah. who was my hero. Oh. But I also used to work in the Arsenal laundry to earn some money to help me play football. And I used to scrub his kit. <laughs> so now it's like how things can change around so much. But I suppose I look back at that and, yeah, people laugh. that Oh, you used to be a scrubber in the Arsenal laundry. 
I had to do that. I, I wanted to play football and you know, my mum couldn't support me. I had to earn some extra money and it just so happens that allowed me to be in an environment that, yes, it's not nice that I had to scrub his dirty kit, but for me, I was looking at the bigger picture. I'm surrounded by Arsene Wenger, by inspirational people like David Dean, that I was learning in an environment where the women's game wasn't there yet, but I was trying to take in all these skills from all these people around me to help me to where I am now. And again, other people looking in will think, oh, it's terrible that you had to wash the men players' kit. But you were one of the lucky ones. Actually. I know. <laughs> yeah. this, this is the crazy thing. I've got a nice lunch every day. I know that. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, you and, um, and Casey Stoney and what have you had those jobs. Arsenal gave you those jobs, yeah. whereas other players at other clubs, and you were being paid uh, appearance money as, yeah. as well, one of the first players and clubs to do that, whereas the rest in this country weren't even getting that, and there were no other jobs. They'd have to work themselves, maybe four shifts, and yeah. then train as well. So Arsenal, thanks to David Dean here in the large part, as many, many people have said over the years, yeah. was a huge, huge factor in that. Um, and it did take champions, didn't it? It took yeah. a champion on the board. It took somebody who really cared. Often they had daughters, and, and that opened their eyes to it. But just a bit of love for David Dean, yeah. sorry, he just deserves <laughs> yeah. it, doesn't he? He does deserve it. Um, and when you were picked up by Arsenal, you went in and you, you worked your way up into yeah. the first team and you had your opportunities and, and you, were, you, know, you were paid for appearances and what have you. Um, what was that environment like in those days? What was it like as you were coming through and breaking into the first team then? What was the environment, the crowds? The crowd, do you know, it was, it's interesting you said earlier about the momentum after tournaments, because for me that was always the hard part when you go back to 2005 when we first hosted the Euros, the opening game, we got 30,000, and this was incredible. We were thinking, this is the moment. And then you go back to club football, and literally you had 10 people watching you. So that mentality shift was so hard because you could see where it could be, but it wasn't filtering down to the leagues, which then led me to after 2007, the World Cup, we were winning everything with Arsenal. We just 2007, we won the quadruple. And you're always thinking, right, people can see it, people can see it, but they couldn't. But then the WPS started and I got drafted over to Boston. And that was my real uh, eye-opener. One, to be in an American environment and understand why they are the best. The mentality, how they treat training every day, the standards that they push you to. We weren't here in Europe or in England, not one bit in terms of fighting for things and how things should be. I think we were always in a mindset over here, we should be grateful, everything. You know, women, you should be grateful to be getting a kit, the hand-me-down kit, that, that was to way too to large. Men's kit. Yeah, yeah, where I was in an environment that you, it's, you don't have to be sorry for wanting to be best and wanting to push those standards on to another level. And then so that, yeah, spending three years in America changed me as a human, a player, it allowed me to go on to then push to be the best right back, which I then went on to be. And actually a culture that it's a team environment to help other people up around you because you need every single member on your team. And when I watch the England team at the moment, that's what I see and that's what I'm so proud of. Mm. And how do you think we've got to this point? <laughs> Everyone in the room, you know, it's and that's what I said. I got emotional in the semi final seeing because today I truly believe we're at a point where everyone's hard work and everyone's effort. This is what we've been waiting for. It's kind of like the 99 moment. That's what I really feel for this country. You know, I was so young and I could see bits, but I couldn't feel it, you know, and I was so excited. But I feel like for Europe, but not just England. For today, what we're going to see and witness is that moment for Europe. And it gives me goosebumps to think about it because there's been so much hard work from everyone. Yes, I get to, I'm on the camera, so young girls see me. But I, I know it's everyone's hard work that's got it to hear. Oh God, my heart's pounding again, Alex. Pounding again. <laughs> just picturing when It gets me emotional. Sue's oh. keeping calm over there. She's going to be keeping me calm later, but yeah. Yeah, Kelly's less calm. Rachel Pavlo. Are you doing, Pav? <laughs> yeah. You feel sick, yeah, that's about, that's about level par for English people. Excuse us in the room, this doesn't happen to us very often, having a chance of winning something. It, please forgive us, Sue's fine, don't worry about Sue, she's fine. <laughs> but I feel that, that's the thing, whatever happens today, because we both know you've got the two best teams in the final, and I know it happened to us in 2009, don't want to mention that scoreline, Nadine. Um, <laughs> But I think Leah said it yesterday, and that's someone who else I'm so proud of, actually. She said, this isn't the end, it's the start of a journey. And I really believe that now a lot of people have woken up to actually to see where this can go. 
and it's exciting. But also, it's not rocket science, is it, Alex? I mean, well, we always knew that. Everyone in the room knows look, that, but there's still certain people that are surprised, you know? We always knew that it was fairly obvious to us that with investment, if you allow players to train full time and not have to stack shelves but that, yeah. around it, that actually they'd have a chance of being better at football and <laughs> exactly. fitter and stronger. The, in, the investment, allowing someone to dedicate everything that they have in their body to their passion and their craft, of course they're going to get better. That's what allowed three years in America that I just had to wake up and concentrate on being the best athlete and best right back or and best teammate that I could be. That's what pushed me on. That's what we're seeing now in the English WSL because you're seeing a whole heap of girls and teams being able to train every day and be honest with their craft and their technique. Do you know what they also have these days, Alex? What do they have? Goalkeeper coaches. <laughs> it's extraordinary. <laughs> Actual goalkeeper coaches. Yeah. They even get to train every day. Yeah. And um, so it all comes back to investing, allowing women to be the best athletes that they can be and this is the, the outcome but there's yes. a little way to go in terms of other countries as well and the investment in all that infrastructure and that's what we're hoping will continue to happen after this tournament as well but I also wanted to talk to you about um, about how you bang the drum for diversity and how it's no longer a case of being okay to have all white male panels anymore and that's not just mm -hmm. in sport that's in any industry that was the that was the default. That was the norm because of lots of cultural uh, reasons and historical reasons. But um, how do you think we're doing on that journey in terms of football, both in terms of playing, in terms of what squads look like, opportunities for players to to get to grounds and training grounds, etc., and in terms of what we're seeing on screen and behind the scenes? <laughs> big question. It is a big Sorry. question. No, <laughs> I'm here for it because I suppose that's been interesting because we've had a whole issue with it during this time with the Euros, with the whole segment on the documentary that I did. And I think sometimes now we're looking at the word diversity, and for some it's like now this dirty word. And actually we're not talking about that, it's about opportunity. Opportunity for everyone to be in a space, everyone for a young girl, no matter what area or what background that you come from, being able to have an opportunity or a dream that you know you can either be a broadcaster on TV, you can be a coach, you can play for a national team. That's all we're talking about. It's not fighting for something else. It's just allowing everyone that's there to to dream. Because I suppose for me that's how it started. You know, I didn't start as a footballer or an athlete because I was thinking about the money that I could make from it, you know. I just had someone I had hope in my heart and a dream in my head that I'd be playing at Wembley one day, you know, and then we're here. It's happening. Um, and so I was just fortunate and I suppose I don't see the reality, you know. When Nadine asked me to come and do this and my first answer is like, why? Like, and she's like, Alex, people want to hear from you. And I suppose I still don't get that in my head. But when people stop me on the street and they're the ones telling me, you need to keep doing what you're doing, I know the effect and the knock-on effect it's having. Mm. But it's about being representative, isn't it? If you've got people at home who are from different backgrounds and yeah. they're not seeing that reflected on the screen, then perhaps they feel that, oh, that industry is not for me, whatever mm -hmm. it may be. I know, and, I so that, and that's why it's so happy. And I'm proud now when I see the likes of when you look across the BBC coverage. You know, you've got so many former female players talking about the game. Now we have female pundits, female presenters in a space where we knew they always should be, but was denied that opportunity. I think that's what makes me so proud. And I think when I was first coming through, and when people were telling me no, I was just like, what? I was confused, because I'm just like, well, I watch Match of the Day every week. I've grown up talking to Arsene Wenger since I was eight, or Mr. Dean. So I know football just like anyone else. I couldn't see it, and I couldn't understand why they were so short-sighted and couldn't see it. And that's why I just kept knocking on the doors. Mm. And do you want to ask you about your academy? your Alex Scott Academy, mm -hmm. how's that going? What does it involve and yeah. what are you trying to make happen there? I think it's the same thing. I think when we talk about sport, sometimes we're always talking about it as an elite level, where I look back in the area that I come from, that we know everyone's not gonna make it to that level, but everyone still loves the game and wants an opportunity and wants a chance to play. So that was my thing. Okay, can I still give a group of girls a chance to have an education, but enjoy football and learn the football skills every single day. And it's a safe space to play football. 
And just finally, because we were talking about diversity and you talked about the, the England squad, it's not necessarily representative of, of certain areas of the country. That's just how it is at the moment. That's nobody in the current setup's fault, of course. Um, but what have you discovered through your conversations in terms of your documentary as to perhaps accessibility of training grounds um, in certain suburbs that can be, or areas rather, that can be difficult for certain mm -hmm. people to get to? What have you uncovered there and what, what have the suggestions been as to how to try to rectify that? Well, the FA are doing everything. They know that basically the investment coming into women's football, we had to get it to a space to help grow the game. But it's actually now looking at those areas and being, okay, now what areas do we need to work on? Which absolutely, I love doing the documentary. I'm so glad that BBC was like, okay, you have full reign, go ahead and you know women's football, make it your own. So I did, and when I was looking at it, obviously we only had an hour, so you can only fit so many topics in. And um, firstly, what we need to remember, this whole tournament is it's a celebration. Today is one big massive celebration and that's what I wanted to show in the documentary. The history, the celebration, the record crowds over in Barcelona, around Europe. But actually today, when it does end, how do we continue? How do we move it forward and in what areas? So we know there's still so many areas. Maternity rights, how you just said, the opportunity that every young girl now wants to go and pick up a ball. Ian Wright said it amazingly on the TV the other day. Giving young girls the chance to play football in PE lessons, in school, instead of them separated so they can't play sport. And obviously then the investment the commercial side, the sustainability, how do we now move the game forward? And I think what I love is getting messages every day because remember, we're, we're opening up this today to a whole new audience as well. Everyone that's been in women's football, but a whole new lot of eyes are gonna be on women's football. And what the documentary does, it shows them the history and the growth and the messages that I get from those people, the emotions behind it. You're like, yes, we're tapping into a new audience as well. Yeah, and when Ian Wright said that the other day, a lot of people mainstream people picked up on it and it's like it took a bloke to say this for you to actually listen it's uh -huh. something that Kelly Simmons and the FA and I'm sure other FAs by the way as well have been saying as well like give little girls the opportunity to play football from that age when they don't have to have a brother by the way yeah. maybe they could just play anyway perhaps <laughs> maybe they don't need a brother to play football with in the back garden maybe if they could play at primary school yeah. or, or when the little boys are given footballs and the girls are given dolls maybe Give them both the football. Do you know what, as well, looking at the pictures behind you and everyone, I think just touched on earlier, you've got a whole group of amazing, incredible women that have stories to tell that can easily sell a product because they are so relatable. And you just need to give them the, their platform and hear from them because um, they're incredible people, incredible athletes. And most of them have got degrees and studied and yeah. researched and done masters and PhDs uh -huh. and all the rest of it. They've got a lot to say. <laughs> thank you so much, no, Alex. Thank you. Um, thank enjoy you the rest me. of your day. I'm shooting off to Wembley. Thank, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you thank so much. You. Brilliant. Thank you so much. You take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Alex Scott. We have another wonderful and another inspiring guest to talk to us now. She is Tanya Joseph, and it's our last guest before the break. Um, we have one comfort break this morning, a short coffee break out there shortly after Tanya. Um, but we're going to step away from football for just a moment and look at the bigger picture and look at grassroots and inspiration as we were talking there with Alex about getting young girls to play and getting women active and it's not all about young girls by the way it's any girls and women to feel that they belong and to feel that they have a role and uh, to feel that they can play sport themselves because historically as we know there are reasons why women have felt less engaged with sport over the years now tanya joseph used her time wisely when she was at the governmental sports agency sport england she was the lead architect behind a campaign called This Girl Can, and it inspired millions of women and girls of all shapes and all sizes to becoming active. Tanya will come up in just a moment after we've seen this video of what it's all about. I'm the hottest round, and if you want me, 
Y'all can't stop me now. Is you with me now? Then pick it, pick it, bounce. I know you think the way I swap, 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 my style. Get your freak on, get your freak on, get your freak on, get your freak on. Um, thank you. Um, as Jackie said, I'm Tanya Joseph and I'm a comms professional. I've basically spent my entire professional life trying to persuade people to do things. Um, and that might have been things like paying their taxes or going for cancer screening, eating more fruits and vegetables, stopping smoking. Um, some of it less noble reasons, eating this particular type of chocolate, feeling more comfortable about the fact you're drinking wine, um, thinking more positively about this coffee chain or that company. But This Girl Can is probably the campaign I'm most proud of in my entire career. The genesis of This Girl Can started in 2012 when I joined Sport England, which is the government agency responsible for getting more people playing sport or being active. Um, I'm one of the people that Cara was talking about. I am not from a sport, back, a sport background. I'm, in fact, the person for whom This Girl Can is designed because I was not interested in sport at all. But it was 2012 and London was hosting the games and why wouldn't you want to get into, into that? Because I thought I might be able to go and see something. In fact, I never did because I was too busy. Um, but it was, I am also South African, so I absolutely know and understand the power of sport to transform people's lives um, as an individual, as a community, as a country. And it was really, and I thought there was something in that that I was interested in. Um, and I got into Sport England and I was really quickly struck by this really stark statistic that on average, two million fewer women and girls are active per week compared to men. And that was just a really worrying um, statistic that no matter what, and remember this is the point where we just had seven years of investment into community sport because England was hosting, uh, because London was hosting the games. <laughs> The gym sector, the, the sports sector has be, we've been telling women, come and do this. The whole beauty industry says, go and look amazing, go and get your bikini body. Um, and healthcare professionals are constantly telling us that being fit is good for us. And yet, women weren't doing it. Women weren't taking these opportunities. In amongst all of those stats, behind that, 70, uh, that um, two million stat, there was another one which was that 70% of women t were telling us that they wanted to do sport, 70%. Now, I had just spent a year at Tesco, which, for those of you who aren't British, it's the biggest retailer in this country, and it dominates um, our grocery market and many of our other markets. At Tesco, if we found that 7% of people wanted to do something, we'd say, that's a market, we're gonna go and get that, right? <laughs> And this was 70% of people were telling us something. So you then ask yourself, well, why weren't we doing that? Um, why, you know, what's going on here? Why weren't we going after these people? And I think it really reflected the attitudes of the sector, of the community <coughs> sports sector in those days. And I see some nodding heads from people that I've worked with in the past. Um, and I think that's partly because that sector is populated by people for who love sport. They're completely passionate about it. I got to Sport England in the January of 2012 and we had snow that year. And I couldn't understand how in the middle of the day people would be like taking off their clothes and going for the ru a run during when it was snowing. And I, for me, it was just inconceivable. But these are people who love sport and they couldn't understand, just as I couldn't understand them, 
they couldn't understand why women, wh why people didn't do sport. Well, and they would say it was the fault of women, and they would say, you, they need to go and find, once they find their sport, it will be fine. And they'd say to me, how come you, you're not, why don't you go running? Why don't you do this? Why don't you, well, I don't know. And they were like, you have, you, once you find your sport, Tanya, everything will be okay, fine. And I think putting the onus on someone to do something, especially in a, a time when there is so many options for us to spend our, the, the time that we have, and all the other, those other pe um, calls upon our time are doing a really great job at trying to attract us to do it. So bars and cinemas and theatre and television and shops are all saying to women, come and do these things. And sports just sitting there saying, well, when you, wh when you decide to come to us, well, we might, may or may not have an offer for you. I think it's madness, really. Um, and I think changing attitudes within the sector to encouraging uh, female participation was then, and I think probably still remains, one of the biggest barriers, if I'm honest. So it was really clear that in 2012 we needed to take a completely different approach. And what we realised is this is a we needed a behaviour change campaign. We needed to listen to women um, who it turns out had been telling us, the sector, for years about how they felt about sport and what the things that they loved and what the things they hated. Um, and we, it meant really needing to understand our audience. In this case, we, the audience that um, we decided to focus on were uh, women and girls aged 14 to 40, um, which is a really huge and diverse audience, right? It's um, women from puberty to perimenopause, which is, you know, a big chunk of the population. And we need to understand and respect that. We also need to really, really, really understand the barriers that were stopping women, especially those 70%. What was stopping them doing what they, they wanted to do? And they, they, would be, they give you thousands of, of reasons. Now, the sector called them excuses because it was obviously the fault of women that they weren't sport, sporting. But they were, lots and lots of different reasons were given. Things like, I don't know the rules, or I'm not really, I don't know how to do it, or I feel too fat, or I feel too thin, or I don't have enough time. And you could really bucket those, those reasons into, into three groups. Uh, lots and lots of concerns about appearance. Women feeling deeply uncomfortable about how they look, how they feel, how they, um, how they might look in, in Lypra. Um, a, a whole group of, of real discomfort about ability. I don't know the rules. People feeling that they're going to be either really bad or too good, and therefore, you know, because being competitive is some, seen as somewhat um, derisory for women. You're not, it's not part of our, you know, the, the gender stereotyping is we're not meant to be too competitive. We're just meant to sit and play with dogs. Um, or actually where your priorities are. You know, I, I'm really busy, I've got children, I've got caring responsibilities, I've got a really busy job, feeling like they couldn't do this. Now, we, would, we spent about three weeks looking at all these different reasons and trying to come up with a campaign that would, would respond to all of that. And I wish it, I could say it was me, but in fact it was one of my colleagues who said, this is about a fear of judgment. This is about women feeling that they're going to be judged badly by themselves or by each other. Um, so we needed to build a campaign around that, and we, our campaign really had put at its heart that fear of judgment is, is nothing to be worried about. Lots and lots of women feel like that. In fact, most women feel like that. You're not alone. And we developed a manifesto, which is worth reading out, because it became our guiding light. And it was that women come in all shapes and sizes and levels of ability. It doesn't matter if you're rubbish or an expert point is you're a woman and you're doing something. And that really meant that whether you're running like Phoebe from Friends or uh, Paula Radcliffe, it doesn't matter, right? Give yourself a pat on the back for going for a run at all. And we decided that we needed to communicate. How do we communicate that? So we didn't want to preach. We didn't want to nag. We needed to talk to women as girls, one of the girls, and being talking to them in their terms. And we also needed to be really careful about who it was that was going to deliver those messages. It would have been really easy to, to do what most advertising campaigns do, and they pick a, a celebrity or an influencer or even an athlete and say, okay, you front this campaign. 
but we knew our audience and we knew that they would be put off by that because they see those women and although they admire them and they want them to do well, especially female athletes, we really, really love them and admire them, they are aspirational and not inspirational for, for the group of women we were attracting. So we, we picked women like them, women like this, um, who look like normal women. That's, in the, that's taken in, um, in Lancashire. Um, this is one of my favourite ones. I don't know if you can see that. <laughs> I love this one. Um, because we need that it needs to be relatable. They need to be women that who could make our women feel like I understand them, I see these are women like me. And it's really interesting to think about what people see in women like me because you could think that the only people that would relate to that would be other teenage girls, but in fact we found in all of the work we did that all women saw a bit of themselves in our campaign. There was one of the posters that, taste, that um, tested extraordinarily well was a picture of one of the netball players that you saw in the film and she had a very, very serious face on, and she's a black woman and she's a bit older, and everyone loved that poster. Everyone responded really positively, and the line was, my game face also wears lipstick. <laughs> and I couldn't, and it was like, I couldn't really understand why everyone loved it. And it's because when we looked at it, when we asked people questions, they loved her attitude. They loved, she, she was like them. So whether you were a white, um, 14 year old or an older woman who was a Muslim, she, they loved her and it was about finding things that, that our audience could really, really relate to. Um, we started the campaign in January 2015 and we went on TV for 10 weeks. We, the campaign was only in its first year, was only on television for 10 weeks and we were in poster sites for about um, 12 weeks and the rest of it was all on social media. And um, in, I, you know, when Cara tells us that she raised that much money uh, to write to, for her club, it's extraordinary, because uh, that campaign, everything about it cost 10 million pounds, which was not a lot of money, but it was the most successful campaign Sport England has ever had. Um, the return on investment was amazing. Now, I've worked on behavior change campaigns, and we'd expected it to go Quite, quite, quite slowly. We expected we might get a change in attitude. We might get people to be aware of it. We hadn't expected that in the first year we'd see any action, but we did. In the first year, 2.8 million women said that they were inspired by the campaign, um, inspired enough to put on their trainers. And 1.8 million of those women were doing it for the first time since they left school, where in this country, uh, P is compulsory, so you have to do it, right? So that was, that was a m amazing, amazing figures. Um, and, you know, it's seven years since we did that campaign, and I still, to this day, get people coming up to me and saying, you changed my life. In fact, my driver today, this morning, told me that his wife had started being doing Zumba because of that campaign. So I'm incredibly proud of it. It takes patient, and um, the most important thing is understanding your audience, and, yeah, you can kick balls and deal with it. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya. I like the one about lapping everybody uh, on the couch. No matter yeah. how slow you go, you get lapping everybody. This one here reminds me to go to the gym. This tournament has meant a lot less gym than usual, but I think we all need to pick up afterwards. Thank you. Um, now, we have a lot of people in the room. Some people here are investors in women's sport. A lot of people in the room need to persuade people to become investors in women's sport. What do you say to them? Um, you have a market. In this country, 70% of women want to be active. That is a market. Go after them. But you need to do it. And I don't think it's about saying it's the same as the men's game or men's sport or getting men active. We are women are different. Okay, apart from anything else, we have loads of different views about the shape of our bodies, we have about our abilities, about the priorities in our lives. So you need to think about what's stopping them. And 
talk in language that they want to, to hear, use the right role models, invest, and don't expect that, you know, these things take time, but it's re go to where they are. Don't expect them to come to you. You have to go to where they are. Brilliant. Tanya Joseph, thank you so much, and congratulations. <laughs> Once again, ladies and gentlemen, hope you enjoyed your coffee break. Now we are back for the second half of Raise the Bar, the UEFA Women's Euro Final Forum ahead of the big match later on today. Now the governing bodies of European and world football are our guardians and our bastions of the game. They have a unique role to play in raising the bar going forward after this tournament. And we have some of the top leaders in the game today. A lot of you out there as well plenty on stage here to give their views as to where we go from here after this record-breaking women's Euro tournament. We have, starting here, we have our head of women's competitions at FIFA, nice easy job that one, and former Northern Ireland captain Sarah Booth, the president of the Romanian Football Federation and FIFA council member, Razvan Berliani, mm -hmm. very welcome as well, the English FAs, uh, Director of Women's Football, Baroness Sue Campbell. Good morning to you. It is still morning. morning. And um, UEFA Chief of Women's Football, former player, FIFA World Best Player Award winner as well. You're looking very embarrassed. Don't be embarrassed. <laughs> be proud. Nadine <laughs> Kessler. And also Lisa Clavenis, former Norway international and current president of the Norwegian FA. Good morning. Welcome to all of you. Good morning. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Nadine, starting with you, uh, it's been a, a fantastic European Championship so far. You know what it's like to play in these tournaments. You know what it's like uh, to win as well. You've worked on Euro 2017. You've led this tournament as well. I mean, just from looking on in terms of watching the football, what's your assessment of it? First of all, I must say, I felt playing was a bit easier than organizing, um, so, um, but it's, it's, it's been a blast. I think really uh, we're super happy, uh, especially also because the football was fantastic. I think, uh, yeah, from the first to now, the last game tomorrow at Wembley, I think it really uh, amazed people. And it's so important because the football matters as well. It matters to the athletes, it matters to the teams. And looking back at my playing days, I think it was not always a given to have a debate uh, on the match results, have banter between people. I'm looking at many faces. I had a lot of banter with over the last four weeks that I spent in England. And I think that is also so important and that we have a time now <coughs> where the sport speaks for itself. What do you mean banter in terms of when? Do you mean after games, you mean TV coverage, you exactly. mean talking to opponents? Exactly, who wins? I mean, I'm German, can you imagine how many English people were all over me for the last... <laughs> oh la la, oh la la. Um, but, <laughs> so, <laughs> not naming you, but she was... No, playing. no, yes, thank you. Uh, but, but exactly, yeah, the results, different views, uh, any kind of decisions related to the game, and I think that's just superb. Yeah, I think it's just become a conversation that everybody's having. You know, it's not confined to the people who play the women's game. It's a conversation that everybody's having right across society, even in my local pub. Um, you know, the four old boys that sit on the stools by the bar. Um, I went in the other night and they couldn't, I couldn't get away. I spent 45 minutes talking about the game. So when it becomes part of conversation like that, you're normalising it. Instead of it having to be a, 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 ni a niche area, suddenly it becomes normalised. It becomes part of what everybody's talking about, and therefore it lifts it to a completely different level, I think. Those guys at the bar, Sue, what, yeah. were, they, what were they saying? Were they talking about the tactics? Were they talking about individual players or the whole spectacle? What was the um, conversation? Their first question, which I thought was, and I told Nadine this, they asked me, is there a rule in women's football that says you can't shout at the referee? <laughs> <laughs> so I said, well, no, not that, no, not that we, it's an unspoken rule. It's not a spoken <laughs> So um, they, were, they were intrigued by the nature of the game. They loved it. They liked the fact it was great to watch. Captured in the words, um, two of them said, you've demonstrated that the beautiful game is back. 
and that this is how football used to be. And, and I, I don't particularly want it to be how it used to be. I want it to be how it is now for women. But I think what the way it's played and the style with which it's played has just really f intrigued people, fascinated people. And, you know, from our domestic point of view, we need to translate that now into people on a regular basis going to watch women's teams. Well, Sue, that is one of the main issues here, isn't it? It's legacy from this <coughs> tournament. Uh, I said earlier, it's not about patting people on the back now. Yes, we can say congratulations for making this successful, but it has to be about where we, as in people who want women's football to thrive, go from here. So from your perspective, in charge of women's football at the English FA, what do you think the legacy will be and how do you achieve it? Well, I think um, <coughs> right now we probably don't know what the impact of this is going to be. In a, I mean, we can guess it, but we don't know it. In terms of legacy programmes, we've been working on legacy for two years. I'm a great believer legacy is not something that happens after the event. You have to prepare for it. So we've been doing a lot of work preparing in terms of widening opportunities, some of the things you've talked about, making sure that we're providing inclusive, diverse opportunities for people to get engaged in the game, play, coach, volunteer, referee in the game, all those things that we all need. Because it's not just about playing, is it? We need better coaches and more coaches. We need better referees and more referees. That's not an insult, by the way, to any coach or referee. I didn't mean better in that sense. But we need, <coughs> we, need, we need more, yeah, we do. If you're going to maintain playing standards but also encourage youngsters to come in, we need coaches who are trained at different levels of introducing the game, developing talent, working at the top end of the game. We need more umpires, referees, officials. We just need to drive the game forward. Um, and so for us, uh, we've got a very clear strategy, we've got a very clear vision. It's about accelerating that vision and going more quickly than perhaps we thought we were going to go prior to this tournament. Mm. And you obviously want England to win later for obvious reasons, but do you feel that if they were to actually <coughs> win a trophy, that would accelerate the process beyond all recognition? Or do you think it will be similar either way, the <sighs> development? I think what we've seen with this tournament is a landmark change for the women's game. And yes, of course, we'd like to win. Um, and that would be very special for us. You know, it'll be the first time we've won a major tournament since 1966. <laughs> and the first when we one played a country called, country called Germany. But, um, you know... <laughs> it wasn't the whole of Germany. No, it wasn't the whole of Germany. <laughs> but, but, you know, we, um, we, we definitely want to win. But most importantly for me, this afternoon is an incredible opportunity to showcase women's football to what will be a phenomenal audience uh, and really inspire and we hope inspire a generation of people to play the game, enjoy the game, watch the game, coach the game, referee the game. Uh, Razban, from your perspective, <coughs> what are your thoughts on legacy from this tournament? First of all, I'm pretty sure that it was an amazing tournament until now and uh, the final tonight will be even much better especially because until now record upon record was broken and this is magnificent especially for Europe because the girls could represent now an inspirational source not only for the Europeans but also the global level which means a lot for us as, uh, as Europeans. At the same time if you are looking to the quality and the talent displayed on the pitch has been impressive. This is, uh, this is maybe the reason why I wanted to be here instead to be anywhere, any, any, anywhere else in the world during this period of time and to have the possibility to be part of this, uh, of this journey because this current euro underlines the growth of women's football. And it's up to us from governing bodies, FIFA, UEFA, national associations, clubs, owners, fans, coaches, players, to have the possibility to move forward and to dream about the next, uh, the next years. Mm. Because your country is one of many, of course, in Europe who <coughs> would love to have qualified, didn't qualify for this one, but how do you think the impact of this tournament will then reflect going forwards in nations such as yours? What can you take away? I can share with you not only a Romanian perspective, but at the same time an Eastern European perspective, which is very important because if you are looking to this final tournament, we don't have any European we don't have any team coming from the eastern, eastern side uh, of Europe. I'm pretty sure that we have a strong legacy for the future. 
And when I'm speaking about this, I'm very happy that the, that the televisions, the, the national television in Romania, broadcasted the second part of the competition. And why? Because the visibility is much important. And if you are looking with what UEFA did strategically to develop the women's football, including also a very good commercial, a very good deal in terms of the TV broadcasting, it's exactly the pathway that we have to follow and to have the possibility to, to develop the football also in, in other countries, in a country like, like Romania. I can share with you at the same time the feeling that the girls from Romania are really, really inspired about what is happening here during these days and during this, uh, during this month in, uh, in England. So which, at the end of the day, this is the most important for all of us. So, so is that on a really inspirational uh, event? Yeah, so on regular TV in Romania, <coughs> the second half of the tournament? Exactly. And do you know if that's reflected in, in other countries of people you've spoken to here? How much has it been on television and how do you know the impact it's having on young girls? I don't have accurate information about other countries, so I, w I would like to, to, uh, to speak more about the Romanian case, but for sure when the event will, will, will be finished, for sure we will look more to, the, to, to all this data. But for us it was very important. And why? Because women football is something pretty new for Romanians and also for the majority of the countries from the eastern side of Europe. So which means that when the national TV station will broadcast the games, will already give the, the, right, uh, the right visibility. Imagine that for the next tournament, we'd like to see on, on, uh, on TV all the games broadcasted. So that will be, let's say, a target that I suppose that we as Romanians, we have to, to achieve, which means that we as governing body, we have to continue to invest in the coming years to force the, te the, the national television to do this. Yeah, and Sarah and Lisa, <coughs> former internationals themselves, now in positions of authority to be able to make a difference, which is wonderful from your perspective. Um, Sarah, first of all, is a former Northern Ireland international, now at FIFA. Northern Ireland, the lowest ranked tournament in this competition. It was a phenomenal achievement for them to reach it. What's your viewpoint on what it can do for women's football, not just in Northern Ireland, but for those smaller nations who don't necessarily regularly qualify for these tournaments? Yeah, I mean, I think Razvan's just mentioned about inspirational stories, and I, I think there's no better story than the Northern Ireland one. Um, you know, Alex and I were just reminiscing there. We, we played England in 2004 in the Algarve Cup. And actually, they got rid of the, the Northern Ireland team in 1999, the Federation. We actually went to Scotland, uh, and they beat us 9-0. And when we came back, uh, they got rid of the team. So we had a hiatus of no, no national team football. So we played England in 2004 when we got the team back together. And you know the resources that we had, the team that we had, we probably had one training session before we actually went to the <laughs> Algarve. You know, and, and England really gave us a hiding in that match, you know. But, to see where this team has come from, uh, this country has come from in, in, in that short space of time. You know, when I worked in the Federation, I started 20 years ago and we had nothing. You know, there was no investment, no resources, no interest. And it was really in the last 10 years uh, when Patrick, the, the GS started, and also when David Martin was the president, you know, they started to invest in, in the game. Uh, UEFA as well, they were really uh, proactive with, with giving programs that we were able to access. Uh, we won a score, we, we won a UEFA hat-trick award, I think Emily's in the room somewhere, uh, and really that kick-started uh, the next 10 years of what happened in Northern Ireland. Um, we hosted the UEFA Under-19 Women's International Tournament in 2017. Sarah organised it. <laughs> um, and, and there was a strategic approach, you know, 2014 was the first strategy. Uh, in that strategy we had this aspiration within 10 to 15 years we would put the resources in place that would give the girls the ability to qualify for a major tournament. So obviously they, 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 they achieved that within uh, the ambition of the strategy and then the, the organization wrote a new strategy recently. So it is, it's a story that can serve as an inspiration. 47 in the world, qualifying to the last 16 in Europe and really putting on a performance. Um, and I think one of the <coughs> biggest things, so when I worked in the Federation, nobody wanted to watch us play. There's a, a running joke among some of the players that I played with. Uh, you know, if you wanted to go to a match, Breather would give you a T-shirt. My nickname was Breather. So that's how we got people to come to watch the matches. And I was back at home for the, the England match in the World Cup qualifiers in April. And it was a sold out stadium. And one of the big things that hit me was one of my good friends 
she was bringing her mum and her mum was bringing 15 friends. And they'd given up bingo that night to come and watch Northern Ireland play. And I was like, okay. And that, that was before even they played in the Euros. That was just the act of qualification had achieved that. And it's, it's an incredible story and, and one that should serve to inspire the world, uh, not just Europe, but the world. And how is FIFA um, tackling that situation that not all federations are equal, not all give proportionately the same amount of, no, it's not just about money, is it? It's about attitude and, and other factors too. So how are you dealing with that? Yeah, it's, it's a really good question. I mean, the reality is, you know, we have the FIFA Women's World Cup next year. It'll be the ninth edition. Uh, in eight editions of the Women's World Cup, only 36 member associations have ever played at that world stage. That's 17% of our 211 member associations. In the men's game, it's double, you know? In the club game, you know, we have the amazing Women's Champions League here in Europe. We have the Copa Libertadores and Comi Ball. But outside of that, we've no established continental club championships. Um, so there's a clear disparity in terms of competitiveness that everyone is offered in the world. So we have a women's football strategy. We have a FIFA vision document. We want to try and increase the competitiveness, the global competitive, competitiveness throughout the world, but also more access. We do that by providing new competitions. For the Women's World Cup next year, we go from 24 to 32 teams. Already we have four debutante teams, so now we're gonna go to 40 MAs, and hopefully some more will come through the playoff tournament. The talk about a new Club World Cup, a FIFA Club World Cup, that's already inspired some of our confederations to set up continental championships. So last year we had the African Women's Champions League for the first time ever. AFC have done a pilot com uh, competition. Uh, I know Carlos is in the room somewhere. He's passionately trying to get a CONCACAF Champions League up and running and also OFC next year will start. So even just the possibility of these new competitions is driving the progress at our confederations and MA levels. And it will improve the development and Absolutely. opportunities and because playing in competitions is very different to just playing in clubs, of course. Um, and Lisa, if I may come to you from the Norwegian uh, Federation. A lot of people in this room may well be familiar with the speech that you gave recently saying that football belongs to all boys and all girls. It, it might seem obvious, mightn't it? That shouldn't be a controversial thing to say, mm. should it? I mean, but when you talk about equal opportunities, which people want to see in football, what does that actually mean, equal opportunities? Yeah, yeah, it means, you know, I work with football. I work with men's football, women's football. So for me, it's about football. And for me, football is for everyone. And, you know, I, I, I slept with my ball. You know, I was 13 till I was 17. So it's pretty crazy. Not normal at all. Uh, and literally, <laughs> every day, you know. And, and we have a lot of girls. Alex, I played against Alex in 2007. They crushed us with Arsenal. I played in Sweden. And, you know, for women's football has gone like this but still they were 100% then, you know, suicidal, awful games and, you, you know, euphoria, big games. And, and we forget uh, because uh, we have progress and we want uh, ROI, you know, return of invest, but the important asset, asset is the game itself. It has been the biggest game for women and girls in the world for a while. So people will still ask, how is it to work in a man's world? How is it to play a man's sport? But it has been a women's, it's my hair, you know. It's, hair. it's wonderful hair, by the way. Yeah, well, thanks. <laughs> it depends <laughs> what, what part of the day you meet me. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, I think, I think it's an obligation for us to, to not say that we should not compare because it's very important to not have fingers because it should be insp inspirational, of course. But, of course, we should also compare or else the men's game can be in the way from the women's game. So I think it's very important that we do as Alexander said, that it should be developed. I, I'm happy that the president says that, but I still think it's very important that we do it on the women's terms, that we respect the history. Uh, this is why I really want to congratulate Sue, Nadine, and also Heike and the German Federation for being here because they have been throughout the history. Uh, and FA has struggled behind Germany, also behind Norway actually, now I cannot <laughs> believe it. <laughs> Debbie was behind, was besides me when we lost 8-0. I wasn't like, going to mention that. <laughs> and she was like, they're was really fighting, Lisa, they're really fighting. Yeah, and you were both super polite. More. I was like, thank you, Debbie, it's, it's really lovely. <laughs> but I do, I do think it's, uh, for me, it's, uh, it's uh, and for all of us, we should celebrate the progress, we should really have return of investment. It's inspirational to hear Kara talk about you know, the investment, but we should never forget 
the ball in the bed and the game who has been big for so long. And it has been 100% the pixel Alex Scott was talking about was everything for her, even though she did not see. So this is what I mean, but uh, it's, it's the boys and the girls sport that we should not define it from the men's side. It should be defined from the field and outwards. And it sounds maybe a little blushy what I'm saying, but I do think it, in every decision it should be like this. Start from the game and out, or else you can start for the ROI or the men, and I think we will miss the body of, of the head. <laughs> you know, then FA will just lose the rest of us, you know. But we, we have to come along. We cannot lose 8 nothing for too long. <laughs> we will come back. <laughs> <laughs> sure you will. <laughs> so the idea of what you're saying makes complete sense. You look at the big picture. It's football, men and women be treated equally. But history is there. Um, we've all been brought up with lack of equal opportunities. So we happen to be going from this position to try to move towards equal opportunities. Can any of you please explain the ways that other national federations can do that practically from the position they're currently in rather than from an idealistic standpoint? Well, well I, I don't have all the answer and I should be very humble after losing eight to nothing, but I do, uh, I do think it's, uh, it's very important to have you know, principle and ethical leadership where you, you, your vision is equality, full equality. Of course, it's not realistic now, but it should be your vision because you can ha not have daughters and sons being treated differently. Not the same, like same pleats or same shirts, but still big area, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, but but uh, that we, in every, every decision, has that vision that it should be equally. So practically, it should mean for example, to have on the national team competitions, to work to have U23 championships for women when you have it for men, or else the balance in my federation will tip. I just have 24 hours, and if you have more competitions, it will tip always, and it should be, you know, European League for women. I do want to congratulate UEFA on amazing work the last 10 years with the women's football, I really do, so applause and really inspiring. But we should do more now, and the rest of us should be pressured you know, to have grassroots for women and girls. We, we need that pressure or else I think uh, we will celebrate like we did after the 2015 World Cup and, and the 2017 Euro, but legacy did not really come. We said it would, but it did not really come. I do think FA will do it because you are you're prepared, also because of you, Sue. But the rest of us, we have to tag along now so the head does not leave the body. Yeah. Uh, Razvan, what are your thoughts <coughs> on what Lisa has to say? In terms of? In terms of how national federations can practically become more <coughs> equal in terms of opportunities for their women, the leadership, um, the practical example that Lisa gave there of under 23's competitions for the women as well. For sure it depends country by country. Mm. If I have to speak about the Romanian Football Federation and about a country which is coming after a communist regime, first of all we have to look to the barriers that we have. First of all, what we discovered, what we found, in terms of one of the most important barrier to engage and to really following women's football, it was the lack of visibility. Imagine, no television, no proper stadiums, and no communication plan to develop, uh, to, to, organize, to organize a football game. This was the reality a few years ago in a country as, as Romania, and similar, with similar with Romania, we'll find also other countries in the eastern side of Europe. So totally different with this event, which is, which is amazing. And for sure, it will, it will be the best ever until 2025. Another, for example, another challenge when we are looking to, to Romania is the gender equality. And we have to understand that the women football was not a priority for the former communist regime, which collapsed in 89 which means that the women's football was marginalized from the sporting perspective, but also from the social perspective and culturally at the same, at the same time. When you are looking to these challenges, immediately you have to adapt your strategy. At the same time, we don't have to forget about the financial difficulties after the 90s and even today. Yeah, so what we will discover in a country, in a country as, Rom as Romania. So which means that we, we discover that we have a systemic issue, a systemic challenge. 
And to solve a systemic challenge, you need a systematical approach. Which means that we started, for example, in, a country, in, in, a, in our country, with different policies in terms of the development of the women's, women's football. One year ago, we were able to have a proper strategy in place, adopted, voted by our Congress, which was for the first time. So yes, these are the disparities between Western and Eastern side of Europe when we are speaking about women, women's football. But what are the results? Eight years ago, nine years ago in Romania, only 330 girls and women used to play football. 300, yeah. You have to be impressed about this figure. 300 girls, yeah, nine years ago. And now we are already over 66,000 girls and women, which means that up to now, it takes a lot of courage for the girls to enter a boys field. Imagine that this was the perception of the women's football in a country as, as Romania. When you are looking at the senior level, we had only one senior division. Now we have three divisions. When you are looking to the youth, youth competition, no competition in the past. Yeah. So this was the reality. Only festivals in the spring, one festival in spring, one festival in autumn. Do you think that it's enough? No, it's not. And this was the reason why the gap increased a lot. What is the reality now? We have competition, national competition, starting from under seven to under 17. We enter in the school system to have the possibility to provide football lessons. Together with UEFA, even we ended up in the kindergarten to have the possibility to inspire the girls playing football starting from four or five years old. So this is the, the, the reality. And if I have to, to have a conclusion about the women's football in the eastern side of Europe, please don't consider that it is a lost cause. No, it's not. We, we have this capacity to come back and we have this capacity, let's say, to fill this, uh, this, this gap and to, to recuperate lost ground quickly. And Nadine, what's your viewpoint on the growth of the game and the challenges in the different parts of Europe? Because of course, as Razvan says, not every country has the same history when it comes to politics, but also attitudes towards women as well. So what's your view on that? The biggest takeaway, I think, for the whole of Europe is everyone is moving forward. It, the attitude, the, 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 the approach to women's football, there is no convincing anymore needed. Thank you very much, all <laughs> presidents, general secretaries, all believers. I think really that, and that's the most important thing. I think UEFA is there and, and can always help, can always drive that change, but people, the most important is that they genuinely want it themselves, otherwise it's never going to be sustainable. I think we have now, almost every federation has a long-term strategic plan. I think everything comes in the end also from big picture. We talk about equal opportunities, but never put your eggs only in one basket, never focus only on the top competitions or uh, only on diversity or only on access. I think it's the big picture that needs to match. Some countries start at the bottom of the pyramid, others start at the top, but in the end it needs to all come together and we're super happy, super proud for what's happened in the last few years. And uh, I think, yeah, it is also reflective on, 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 on the pitch and, and yeah, how, how, how Europe's been also um, a representative to the rest of the world. I think one of, one of the things that I think w we share responsibility for is that football is probably one of the most powerful tools to change lives. And it's certainly one of the most powerful tools to drive equal opportunities. When you look at you know, government legislation and policies, they don't reach people in the way that football reaches people. So for me, the power of this game is enormous in terms of addressing some of those inequalities that have lasted for many years in many societies. Because football regularizes or gets the eyes of people onto it that say, hey, if girls can play football, then maybe they can be an astronaut and go to the moon. Uh, it changes attitudes to girls and women in society, not just in the game. And I think we share responsibility. This is the most powerful tool we have across the world, I believe, to change attitudes to girls and women. And certainly for me, the moral purpose of what we've tried to do here in England is just as important as the business purpose of producing winning teams. Our moral purpose has been to say, 
we think we can improve the lives of girls and women in society by the way we deliver football in, in the community and on the national stage. Backheeled goals going through goalkeepers' legs tend to help get that message across quickly. What do you reckon? Well, I think, you know, Alicia Russo, if she was sitting here, would be very humble, and, and she is a very humble young lady. But what that speaks to is a woman on a stage where she's completely comfortable, where she doesn't feel she's borrowed it from men or that she has she got a right to be there. And, and she can express herself with an audacious piece of play like that. Um, and, you know, one of the wonderful things, I went to Trafalgar Square the other day, uh, which has got all sorts of things going on, and there was a young... There was a, a, a session going on with young people who were amputees. And there was a young boy who was an amputee working on his crutches, and he turned and bashed with the one leg he'd got, he bashed it in backwards. <laughs> and it just made me want to cry, because you're changing lives. You're making people realise anything is possible. Every little girl watching that goes... I mean, I would imagine every little girl's gone out and had a go at doing that. And that is fantastic because it's an expression of difference and who we are and what we want to be in the world. And I, and I think that's why it's so powerful. And do you feel, Lisa, that uh, you're just smiling away, thinking of the, the, the little girls <coughs> trying to copy that goal Alessia Russo scored uh, for 3-0 against Sweden uh, recently. But what do you think this Euro can do for little girls and for the equality that you're talking about aiming for at national federation level for both boys and girls? What can it do for the minds of those people? Yeah, like I, I've heard it so many times before and it happens in small bits and pieces and now I really believe we're gonna take a big step, but I had believed it before, so I'm very focused on making it happen in my own country and, and also support to the other countries on really happening now because it's, it's a breakthrough to have boys refer to women stars, but we should never then think Nadine was not a big star, you know what I mean? So <laughs> it's very important to, to not take the ladder because then the body will leave, the head will leave the body again. Uh, because I hear everyone say, now it's so good, now the game is so good, so <laughs> fast. But did you see the Japan-United States games 12 years ago? It was amazing, yeah. amazing game. Yeah. But still, it's very good now, and it's better. So I, to me, it's a balance. It's always, when you're a women player, we always had, we grew up with a fear of judgment. Who said this? Tanya, Joseph, or whatever. <laughs> so a, a superpower for us is, is also to, to have the balance between competing, but also be, we have been going through a fear of judgment and we should pass this to our stars now. The friction we should appreciate. I'm stealing quotes now from Cara and, and uh, Tanya. Uh, because the women's game is a bit different that way. It's about equality. It's about being role models. It's about the fight to be free as a woman and as a person. Mm -hmm. But in the end, it's still about football. And to me, this is very concrete. It, it, it sounds like this, but it's, you should have the same competitions in this. You should not, if you have one on the men's side, you should ask yourself, why not on the women's side? Because if you say return of investment is not good enough yet, no, because you're then stealing of the emotion. The emotion is still the same. So if you take it on the women's side, you will have Rousseau's or Nadine's, I would say. We cannot forget that you were very good, annoyingly good, by the way. <laughs> she probably still uh, is. I lost so many times to these people. Uh, yeah, so, so, so I, do, I do think this, this Euro can be a breakthrough. But I do think it's very important that it goes to the club level, like it did now in the Champions League. 90,000 were there. I was crying besides Nadine <laughs> as a baby uh, because I never thought clubs. I played in front of 100,000 people in China 20 years ago. So that the nationalism has always been there. But the clubs, have, that, that has never happened before. Yeah, absolutely. And then you're in the cells, the oxygen of football. But if I add to Lisa also, I think that's very important that we get a national team and club football to strive. I think yeah. it was an exceptional year, a huge compliment to European clubs. I think what this Champions League season has done also for the Euro, in other countries, I mean, England, fantastic, but in other countries, the interest, um, I can, I'm really proud to say that both the Euro and the Champions League became a mainstream, a mainstream in, in global sports coverage. So. When did we have that? I remember very well, it was uh, maybe only a couple of years ago where we were confronted with the criticism, there's only the World Cup and in between what's there. I think 
These are examples. There is something in between. There are domestic leaks. They're all, all also already showing there is something in between. And now we need to convert that in a reality across, across, across Europe, across the world. But the appetite is not just there for the very top competitions. We have some fantastic leaders in football here. And Sarah, it's important that there is diversity in leadership, of course, as well, to have different perspectives and to be representative and what have you. I mean, how do we make more space for women to have access to those key roles whereby they get to make decisions? Yeah, I mean, this is, this is critical as we move forward with the game. Um, and, you know, we, we actually work with UEFA. We have a, a FIFA leadership program. I know there's a number of women in the, in the room that have come through that leadership program. And, and programs like that are so important. Razvan talked about the strategy, and the dean says all the European MAs have a strategy, and and those um, those pieces of, of of information are critical in making sure that those spaces exist within the game, in those key decision making roles, and there's also the opportunity for the women to step into those roles, and and that's going to be really crucial. There's a, an excellent confederation here with a really passionate women's football team, um, and and those opportunities are only going to get better as as this confederation develops. And for me, this whole Women's Euro, the most powerful thing about it, and, and Cara spoke about it, it was the cultural mm. shift and the activism of our players. And I think we've witnessed that here. We saw it you know, in the music at the start. We've seen it in you know, Josephine Henning's beautiful digital art collaboration. <coughs> you know, we've seen it in the campaign, the Not Women's Football. So we are witnessing a moment here. We know women's football is a cultural, it's a social movement. We know it's more than just football. And in that space, there has to be more female leaders and, and more of us at the table to make sure that we make the right decisions for the women's game in the future. Are you seeing that, Razvan? Are you seeing women rising throughout federations, yours included, towards positions of leadership and being able to make those decisions? For sure, and uh, it's up to us, let's say, the guys that in this moment we represent the governing bodies, FIFA, UEFA, national associations, to open the organization. I think that this is the most and most important, and when I'm speaking about the openness, I'm speaking about also in terms of the investments that we have to do about this, uh, about uh, about the women's football, and also to encourage women, let's say, to be instead of us, the men, yeah, in the governing uh, in the governing bodies. Because if we'll have a such a such target, I think that many many things will uh, will change, and the gender equality will be there. Let's say we'll have finally inclusive inclusive organizations. Because what we really need in this moment, especially because we are living in a troubled Europe with a lot of inequities, with a lot of discrimination, violence at the state level, also and we don't have to, to forget, is about what we have to build up for the future generations. Yeah? And education and solidarity it's, are exactly the values that we have to put in front, uh, in front of us. Because it's easy for us to talk about we need women in positions of leadership, we need equal opportunities, those are words, but this whole forum is about trying to inspire people to make a practical difference for these things to actually be implemented. Do you think, generally speaking, that it's a good, any of you actually, do you think it's a good idea to have specific targets that there must be certain numbers of women and uh, non-white people, <coughs> perhaps diversity targets at leadership level for it to actually happen sooner rather than later? Or do you think, no, it's fine, it'll just happen naturally? Oh, sorry. Any of you? Oh. Um, we, we, um, we at the Football Association have introduced a, a sort of complete code, diversity code, which clubs have signed up voluntarily, uh, which, which has some recommendations in. I think quotas can be dangerous, if I'm honest. I think sometimes that's, that ends up with people putting someone in a position as a gesture rather than as a reality. Unless they're the best. Unless they're the best, absolutely. At what they... Yeah, I yeah. mean, that, that's, I think, a danger if you start having quotas. People start filling the quota but not really looking at the quality of the people. But I think what we all, again, have a responsibility to do is to provide really good programmes to support people who want to be leaders with management skills, with advocacy skills, with their ability to kind of rep communicate effectively. Um, and, and, you know... We, assistant we're doing a lot of work where we're putting coaches into mentoring positions from from diverse backgrounds so that they're getting an opportunity to see what it's like to work with an England age group squad um, and then looking at how we help them translate that into full-time careers in coaching 
So we, it's, a, it's not an, there are no easy solutions to diversity. Uh, gender diversity is, you know, we're still battling with it. The wider diversity in terms of ethnicity, you know, we are doing huge amounts, but it, it takes time and you've got to be really nurturing and you've got to check your own culture because the culture you create, you think is really welcoming. But to people with a different perspective or from a different ethnic background, they'll come in and they'll feel really uncomfortable. So you have to constantly check your own culture and make sure that you truly are being inclusive rather than exclusive. And, and I think the problem when you get into powerful positions, you tend to want to stay there. Uh, and, and the danger with that is you've got to constantly be growing the people around you to take your place. You know, great development is making yourself redundant. That's my philosophy. So if, you, if that's your belief, then you're nurturing all the time people around you and checking the culture to make sure that people can step up, can grow, can stand in these important positions and make good fundamental decisions. No, I, I agree with this, and I, but I do think it's important to have balance as, as leaders that you, you have a toolbox and, and to have forced action is, is one of the tools you have. And, and of course, it, it's not a preferred one. You want inspirational, but, but you see football in Europe, it's, it's, it's a pretty old sport now for women. From my perspective, in my whole life, it's been football. But it was pretty static for a while. So you would see boards, for example, with men all this time. So, so the evolution, you cannot, it's not guaranteed to go like linearly upwards. <laughs> so you could say it takes time, but then you need, sometimes you need force. And in the beginning, maybe you will have is she good enough? But the next time you will have evolution. Like in our board, we have we have 50 50 percent, and it's it's 50 percent women, 50 percent men. And I do evolution has made it. You know, it's it's equally good men and women. I think there. It's I, I don't feel the women in, in my board is any you know superior or, or less superior to the men. And I do think you know we have to be forced a bit on this. Also UEFA, also FIFA. Of course, you cannot have boards with one one, one woman. Uh, and, and say that that is max, you know, because that is the practical consequence of it. And it has taken decades. So it, it takes time, it takes time. Of course, there's good enough women to be more than one. And I don't even know if this co is controversial, but to me, it's, it's very given that we need, you don't need a quota, but we need the people to say it. Yeah. The people in leadership to say, next year, I want actually 50-50, <laughs> you know, not just two, 50-50. Uh, and national federations, you mean? Federation, confederations, and then clubs will follow because they are in competition. They will always follow, you know, the more, you know, the, the governing bodies. I'm not saying it is, is easy. It's very difficult. But without the decision to have vision, e full equality, it takes 100 years. Yeah. UEFA has been for a long time, and now we have a, one very good woman there, but it's one, you know, and, and, and FIFA, you know, so I do think... This is important. Sarah, your view on, um, on leadership of, of having women in, in these senior roles and how it perhaps makes the jobs of other people who are trying to develop women's football easier, does it? Yeah, I mean, one, one of the things I'm looking around the room and it's, it's the community that we actually have right now. I keep looking at Kelly Simmons because I mean, when I started in, in the IFA 20 years ago, Kelly Simmons and I think Rachel Pavlow is still in the room, they were my mentors, they were my you know, inspiration. You know, what they were doing in England, they were saying, Look, have you tried that in Northern Ireland? So I think it's about using your networks and realizing the community that we already have of leaders, uh, aspiring to be those leaders, but also sometimes, you know, Kelly saying, you know, you should go for that role or you, you have the ability to do that. Um, stop smiling. Um, so I, th I think it's using the resources that we have properly. Uh, and I think sometimes it's just having the courage to take that step. Um, but the game has to change. It is changing. It's changed a lot since we, we played a long time ago, Lisa. So um, it can only get better, but there have to be bold, brave steps taken by all of us. And I say that collectively. The players, the MAs, the clubs, the leagues, the confederations, and also FIFA. Um, but, but it has to keep driving forward for sure. And I guess, you know, we've appointed, she's somewhere in here, I think, Debbie, uh, as the first woman chair of the FA in its entire history. Um, that's a landmark moment for us, and it's a big statement um, because, you know, when I first came into the FA, um, there certainly wasn't equality on the board. There wasn't equality on the senior management team. There is now. There's a, a really good balance. But to actually have the association appoint the first 
woman chair of the association. And she did get it because she's good enough. Sorry, Jebby, I hope you didn't think I was talking about you. Um, she, you she, got <laughs> she got it because she's an outstanding person and, and she's already having a massive influence. So to pick up your point, when you put someone in a, a, an influential position like that, and obviously she, you know, she earned that position, but it's having a huge impact already on the rest of the organisation. And it's interesting you talk about diversity and whether there should be you know, quotas or not, but then you actually look at the three former internationals here doing an incredible job, and you look at so many women's footballers who have degrees, MAs, PhDs, or are already educated, and these programmes that they can go on during their playing careers to then step into these positions of authority, these women are out there, aren't they? It, it shouldn't be that difficult. I can see a light flashing. They're nearly all over. Oh, my goodness. That means that we're getting even closer to kick-off tonight, which has <laughs> got the old heart going again. Um, but just very finally, I don't know if you're going to want to give a score prediction or not, but can you give us an idea as to what we can expect tonight? We have an English person and a German person on the panel, so I'll go to the Norwegian, Norwegian representative <coughs> first. What do you reckon? Yeah, no, I, I don't dare to say anything, but you know, I lost to Germany so many times, I don't, I don't know anything else. So <laughs> I don't know Neither anything do else. we. No, so, but sorry, Nadine, then I, then I, for the change of it, would, would hope for a change, but I don't know anything else. So let, let's say it that way. <laughs> I don't dare to say it. It's Go on, right? You know, I I will of course publicly uh, maintain my neutrality, <laughs> my UEFA badge, my UEFA oh, badge. Um, but you should never underestimate the Germans. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> I said that in Barcelona. Also. Oh, that's cool. Um, I hope we will be still friends and uh, maybe. I think, uh, yeah, you have a lot of support, but again, you know, watch out. <laughs> Just no penalty shootouts. <laughs> Sorry? Just no penalty shootouts, please. Uh, oh, so no. You, you, you feeling okay? Yeah. Mom? <laughs> um, I'm, I'm serene, a serene person, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty calm. Um, we do not underestimate Germany. They are an extremely talented team. They've played really well. They're in great form think we are as well I would just hope for one of the greatest showcases of women's yeah. football yeah. and yeah of course we want to win but but you know at the end of the day I think we've already won I really do think the game in this country has already won um, so I just want a great game of football this afternoon and and may the best a team win nice <laughs> 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 let's leave it there let's leave it there thank you so much Pleasure to hear from all of our panellists today. And now I'd like to introduce a guest who knows a thing or two about winning, just like Nadine does. She is a three-time UEFA Women's Champions League winner, twice as a player and once now as a coach and a six-time French League champion as well. She is former player and current head coach of Olympic Lyonnais. It is Sonia Bonpastor. Hi. Hello. Jackie. Now, we have the option here for translation. There was me thinking that Sonia's English perhaps might not um, be I fluent. Do my best, and then I spoke to her earlier, and oh my goodness, it is fantastic. But we're going to give you the option if you would like to slip into some French to explain in greater depth. Jackie, something. just for you to know, um, I'm trying English. And uh, I need, if I need your help, you just help me because you are women and we need uh, to be together. So, well, and just for everyone to know, I'm very excited to be here. And as a coach, I'm excited just to watch the final without pressure. But just I'm making my pressure on now, <laughs> trying my best English with everyone and uh, with my uh, French accent. So sorry, but I'll do my best. I told you it was fantastic English. No. <laughs> I told you, I did. It's, it's absolutely wonderful. And thank you so much uh, for coming to chat to us today. Um, first of all, 
we'd love to know what, and, you know, it's been a, a fantastic tournament, but what would you say has surprised you or impressed you or what have you made of what you have seen in this tournament? Um, I think we, are, we have a lot of quality and uh, we are seeing an offensive soccer football with a lot of goals. As a former defender, I wouldn't like uh, playing this tournament because a hard time for them. But uh, yeah, that's uh, great. Yeah, it's been a great tournament. I'd um, love to get your views on Olympique Lyonnais and how they have developed to become the club that they are today. How would you describe the ethos and the mentality of what they've tried to achieve and how they've done it? I think everyone knows in this room uh, the importance of the president, Jean-Michel Aulas. Uh, it just started a few years ago in 2004 with a white page and um, he has his own vision and he always um, believed uh, women were able to do great things and uh, it just started and uh, he gave us all the opportunities to grow uh, as players, as women, as a club and um, yeah, he's very inspiring and uh, he just, his vision is very simple. He's, he just thinks when he makes a decision for the club or he, on his own life, uh, he has to make the, uh, the same decision for men and women. And after that, he just makes the decision and he gives the opportunity and uh, all, the, um, all the things you need to achieve the goals. So it's come from him, he always had that mentality, you think? He always believed that women should have that opportunity and could achieve great things? Yes, yes, because in, in, in his uh, own story, um, we had a lot of opportunities to talk about also his life, so he's very human. Uh, and um, he always told me uh, he has a mum uh, who was a teacher and um, so in his education, uh, her mom was uh, yeah, very uh, present and uh, uh, for him, women and men, that's the same. And he just wants to give the same opportunities to both. Well, we're talking about somebody who wanted to be here today. He really did and was planning on being here. But unfortunately, for reasons beyond his control, he can't be. But he was so keen to be here that he's left us a video message. So let's hear from him now. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Un grand merci Nadine pour avoir organisé cette manifestation qui va servir en fait le développement du, du foot féminin, du sport féminin d'une manière générale. J'ai été amené à m'y intéresser en 2004, non pas parce qu'il y avait une volonté à tout prix de le faire, mais parce que l'opportunité s'est traduite avec le FCL qui était un un groupe féminin, un club féminin très important à Lyon. On est donc parti d'une feuille blanche avec une idée, parité, faire en sorte que, au travers des qualités de la femme d'une manière générale et dans le sport, eh bien, on puisse créer des structures à tous les niveaux qui soient extrêmement cohérentes et le plus proche possible à l'identique maintenant, après des années de, de construction, de celles qui existaient pour les hommes. Nous avons donc pris cette identité, la femme, qui apporte des choses tout à fait importantes à l'ensemble du club. Le sport féminin qui se décline avec des réalités identiques entre les hommes et les femmes. On a été le seul club français à obtenir sept titres consécutifs chez les féminines 13 et avec une rupture d'une année et aujourd'hui le 14e mais pour montrer que eh bien on avait cette capacité à réaliser des choses fantastiques parce que le foot féminin est fantastique mais aussi à servir d'exemple à l'ensemble du football masculin parce que eh bien, il y a beaucoup de très belles choses à prendre dans le foot féminin que l'on ne retrouve pas encore dans le foot masculin. On voit que la totalité des grandes équipes aujourd'hui ou des grands clubs ont une équipe féminine. Les grandes sélections ont aussi beaucoup investi eh bien, parce que d'une part 
les retransmissions sont à des niveaux d'audience qui sont exceptionnels, mais les sponsors ont aussi acquis cette certitude qu'aujourd'hui le foot féminin était un vecteur absolument incroyable. Il y a des valeurs reconnues très fortes, aussi bien à la FIFA qu'à l'UFA. Il faut maintenant évangéliser, faire en sorte de montrer que ce qui était avant une grande histoire et une grande aventure est maintenant en fait la réalité irrémédiable et sans aucune absence d'incertitude vers un foot féminin qui va se rapprocher inéluctablement du foot masculin avec des réalités qui sont des réalités tout à fait formidables. Merci à vous toutes, à vous tous et à très vite. Merci Jean-Michel. Hola. It's interesting that he clearly has the mentality that he thinks women's football is worth investing in. Do you think Olympic Lyonnais is a great example to other clubs? Should they look to them and see the reasons there as to why they should be sponsoring, putting money into women's programs, businesses as well? Yeah, I think so, because when you look at um, the picture of Olympic Lyonnais, uh, of course, it's uh, a lot about the results and uh, all the titles um, we won, uh, but also uh, about the values. And the president were talking about the values, and I think in women's game, women's sports, that's something who is very important. And uh, what he did, what we did with the club, that's a very example. And I think today, Olympic Lyonnais is a brand in the world, in the entire world. And I think um, in our values, we have the humility to uh, keep working very hard. We want to stay at the high level, but also we are always uh, trying to uh, move forward, always trying to uh, speak with the other clubs just to uh, find the best solutions to, to grow together and to be the best, the best team in the world. Because it's not good if you just have a couple of clubs at the top or three or four who are investing because you've just got the same teams competing every year. You want the clubs towards the bottom to be investing, presumably, and making it a much better league as a whole. Do you see that happening? Yeah, uh, Florence Ardouin, who is uh, the uh, general director of the French Federation, uh, we talk a lot because I think uh, we have to be strong in the relationship between the clubs and the federation. And what England is showing to the world, that's a good example. And I think uh, with France, we have to be inspiring with that. Uh, I was very happy, of course, as a coach, but also as a French uh, person to win the Champions League because uh, it means like French soccer is still in uh, the high level. But uh, we have to work because uh, we know in Europe and in the world, uh, a lot of clubs, a lot of countries are working very hard and that's not easy. That's not easy because we won this title this year, but we know Spain, Italy, England, they are working very hard and it makes it hard for us. So we have to be very competitive. It's like keep raising the standard. And that final exactly. that you talked about this year against Barcelona in Turin was absolutely outstanding. We talk about this Euros showcasing the women's game. That final did as well. What was it like to be involved, but winning from the sidelines, not playing? Yeah, that's, uh, uh, the feelings are very different. Uh, the biggest uh, difference maybe was my age, <laughs> because <laughs> I was the youngest when I was a player. But yeah, when you are a player, you are very focused on yourself and uh, what you control yourself to make the team win. Uh, when you are a coach, you always have to think to everyone else. You never think about you and your brain is uh, never stop. You, <laughs> you always think, think, think about the team, the club. So when you are the coach, you are just proud because you make the team winning, you help the, win the team to win and the club at the best level. So that's what the president wants from me, from my staff. And uh, yeah, when you achieve the goal, you are very happy and proud. Yeah, 
Jean Michel Olas will have enjoyed that, wouldn't he? That final. <laughs> um, and I have to ask you, I'm fascinated by the fact that you have four children anyway. Anyone who has four children, I'm fascinated by, frankly, <laughs> and how they how they leave the house in the morning. Just that is an achievement. <laughs> but to actually do what you do and what you're achieving, um, you had your first baby just after completing. Um, your playing career. Can you tell us a bit about that and about your perspective and, and whether you intended to always wait until the end of your career? Yeah, I think for me it was a personal choice, but uh, today, as um, some people already said, we are in 2022 and um, my assistant coach, Camille Albili, is uh, just here also in the room and she always tells me, Sonia, when we are a woman, we don't have to choose between job and career and uh, personal life. So for me, that's the same. If you want to be a player, an athlete at the high level, and if you want to have a baby during your career, you don't have to make the choice. You just have to take your decision and expect the club to help you to uh, find the best uh, solutions for to uh, be with you and to, yeah. Accompany you, uh, yeah. Sorry, yeah, to support you. <laughs> to support you, thank you. Yeah, because that that is a difficult decision because not every player plays for Olympic Lyonnais yeah. or Chelsea or those clubs who have managers such as you who are supportive. And so, how difficult is it now in this in this modern era, or how e how much easier is it perhaps for um, Melanie Loipoltz at Chelsea, for example, to have a baby now? Siobhan Chamberlain uh, did at Manchester United, but then she retired. Do you think it's getting easier for players now? Um, it's not easier. We had the two examples. So with uh, the Iceland player, Sarah gunars dotier who had a baby. She came back in January to the club. And I think even when you are a woman, you uh, fix some goals and you think like, OK, I'm going to have my baby and I'm going to work very hard because that's the way we are. Uh, to come back, but that's not that easy because uh, I had the chance to experience with her a return and it's very hard because, uh, yeah, your body changed and I think maybe the most is important is to feel the support during the first or the second year of the baby because as a mum, it's when you want to be with your baby also. So um, that's not easy and now we have Amel Majri, the French international player, who just uh, had a baby in July, and uh, yeah, we are going to try to work with her to make uh, things easier, but uh, that's not easy for them, and uh, we have to yeah, fix uh, uh, things just to make uh, it easier. And is that part of the development of the women's game, that clubs can then consider how they communicate with players and contracts as well to to make sure that those players don't feel isolated and alone while train, trying to make that decision. Yeah, I think that's our rule, and uh, that's a specific uh, thing for women, you know, to have this opportunity to have a, a child during uh, her, their career. So I think the clubs have to be open-minded on that. I know it's not easy, uh, and as a coach, maybe if all of my players come to me and say we are pregnant, I will say, <laughs> okay, and now <laughs> who is going to play on the field? But uh, yeah, we have to be uh, innovant, um, innovative, innovative about that subject. I know it's new and it can be, it can scare people, but uh, yeah, we have to listen to the athletes <coughs> and to yeah, try to help them. Yeah, and just finally, you were telling me earlier you've had a lot of support from your club. Yeah. in terms of helping you to be a coach with four children at home. Yeah, that's true. And uh, it's for that reason when you have a person as uh, Jean-Michel Olas um, in my position, when he just asked me if I wanted to be the coach for Olympic Lyonnais team, um, I was just telling him, I feel like I can be the coach uh, from my um, position, but also I'm a mom of four kids and I want to do bo both uh, in a good situation. And he just told me, Sonia, what do you need from me to do both and to be confident with both? I just said, I need to have someone at home, 100% at home, to take care of the kids when I'm traveling, when I have a meeting and I cannot go to take them at the school. And he just looked at me and he said, okay, in your salary, I'm going to give you money just for you to take someone at home 100% and to pay the person. Mm. So 
I know it maybe it should be like normal to do that, but uh, as we said, for women, I was like, wow, thank you so much, President. <laughs> and I just went to the pitch and I was like, I need to work hard just to show him and to prove I'm able to do both in good situations. Yeah, that's fascinating. And he got his reward, didn't he? Yeah. With a dirty, great trophy. <laughs> yeah, Massive right. trophy. Thank you very much. And uh, the exciting thing as well for, for those of us who are mums who work in football <laughs> is the fact that later on today, the winner of the UEFA Women's Euro 2022 will either be a mother of two or a grandmother <laughs> in Martina Foss Tecklenburg, who became a granny in March. So thank you so much. Congratulations on all your achievements and uh, blazing a trail for other women as well. Sonia Bonpastor, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Mm.